Museum of Archaeology of Moscow Moscow was not built in a day. The early history of Moscow as a city is connected with Prince Yuri Dolgoruki. The chronicle says that he arrived on the territory of a small settlement of Moscow on the 4th of April 1147. The chronicle relays the following message. Come, visit me, brother, in Moscow. This way, Prince Yuri communicated with his military ally and relative, Prince Svetoslav from Novgorod Siversky. And the two princes met here, in Moscow. Thanks to this event, we know that Moscow existed at the time under an older name, and we know how the small Moscow looked like. It was a modest fortress on the top of the Borovitsky Hill. We can imagine this looking at the work by Apollinari Vasnitsov. Our museum had a lasting and fruitful cooperation with the artist who created for us a lot of graphic and artworks depicting both images of ancient and medieval Moscow and of the people who used to live here. In the picture, we see the Moskva River. That was the main transportation and trading artery. Of course, we understand that the fortress was not too small in 1147, since two Druzhinas, retinue of princes, about a hundred warriors, met here, which means the place had to have enough space to accommodate them for several days. We also know that to mark this meeting, or perhaps as a trizna, a funeral feast, for his son Ivan, who had died a short while ago, Yuri Dolgoruki conducted here a sumptuous feast, or, in other words, a special event. The next work by Apollinari Vasnitsov features the building of the first Kremlin walls, commissioned by Yuri Dolgoruki in 1156. The artist depicted the process of constructing a wooden fort. As the top of the Borovitsky hill was covered with pine woods, the first fortress was built from the material at hand, the pine, but the ramparts were made of oak. This log is a unique item, since it was part of the rampart fortification structure that supported the walls of the first Kremlin. This log is oaken. It was found during one of the earliest archaeological digs in the territory of the Moscow Kremlin. There are only two small fragments of the wooden structure left that prevented the crumbling down of the rampart that was used by defenders of Moscow to build a fort upon. Naturally, wooden walls were prone to fires. They were burned and rebuilt again and again. In the early 14th century, Prince of Moscow Ivan I Kalita ordered to replace the Pine Kremlin with a Noken fortress. It was also during the rule of Ivan I Kalita that the first buildings made of white stone, single dome churches mostly, were erected. The first stone walls of our Kremlin were built in the late 14th century under the rule of Prince of Moscow Dmitry I, whom we all know under his military name Dmitry Donskoy. <laughs> 
However, there were still 13 years to pass before the famous Battle of Kulikovo in 1380 at the time. In 1367, Dmitri I launched the construction of limestone walls that was mined not far away from Moscow, in the Machkov quarry, which survived to our days. The next change would happen to the white walls of the Kremlin in over a hundred years. This would happen under the rule of the great prince of Moscow, Ivan III, in the late 15th century. The construction of red brick walls, we are used to so much, was launched in 1485. The famous Kremlin walls of red brick were built under the rule of the great prince of Moscow, Ivan III, in the late 15th century. These walls were constructed using the most advanced architectural practices of fortress building of the time. The fact is that Ivan III took Byzantine princess Sofia Paleologina as his second wife. When she moved to Moscow, she brought a great many of wonderful craftsmen with her. Among them, there were Genoese, who were considered the best builders of fortifications in Europe. Let's have a look at a model of our Kremlin made in 1947 to mark the 800th birthday of our capital. The Kremlin seems to be situated on an island, being protected by natural water barriers, rivers Moskva and Niglinnaya at two sides. We will not see Niglinne today, since it is hidden in an underground tunnel, but it used to be visible then. The Kremlin was built on the spot where the Niglinne river met with Moskva. On the third side, where the Red Square is situated today, a special moat was dug. The moat used to complete or close the water ring that protected the Kremlin. The moat was named after its creator, Italian architect Alozio da Caranzano, or Aleviz in Russian. So, the moat was called the Aleviz moat. And to allow water to fill the moat, there were built special bridges, dams and barrages. So, the moat was called the Aleviz moat. And to allow water to fill the moat, there were built special bridges, dams and barrages on the Niglinne river to regulate the level of water in this complex engineering structure, the moat. Note that the Kremlin had double walls at the Zemoskorechye side, from where various Tatar troops would attack the fortress. And there were few through towers equipped with special gates and additional smaller towers called arrow towers. One, two, three, four, five. We can see here there were six towers with gates that allowed access inside Kremlin. Naturally, the defense of these towers was a top priority. But it was also easier for the defenders, because they didn't have to guard the whole perimeter of the fortress at the same time. Look at the Spaska tower that we all love and know so well. It had two smaller arrow towers with cannons fitted on them. The cannons, located at the Spaske and Nikolske towers, could cover the whole space of the Red Square, which was the most vulnerable spot of the fortress, since it allowed the easiest access to the Kremlin. Therefore, the place was given a good protection. The Kremlin hosted the chambers of the Great Price, this large building of white stone, and the main Kremlin cathedrals. Only the center of the Kremlin, the Soborne Square, preserved its original architectural complex, including the Cathedral of the Dormition, the Cathedral of the Archangel, the Cathedral of the Annunciation, the personal chapel of the princess, and the bell tower. Here we can see a model that depicts the Kremlin in the early 17th century. But why can we be so sure of the period? The fact is that the bell tower of Ivan the Great, which used to be the highest point of Moscow for a very long time, was built. 
or better say upgraded, to its modern height in the early 17th century under the rule of Boris Godunov. The model does not show the rest of the buildings located inside the Kremlin, because the majority of the Boyar houses that used to be situated inside the Kremlin walls were built only in the 18th and 19th centuries. However, the two most ancient monasteries of Moscow, the Tudov Monastery and the Ascension Convent, were destroyed after the October Revolution. The Kremlin is the first and the earliest fortress of Moscow, but it's not the only one. Altogether, there were 44 fortification walls. One of the medieval Moscow plans that survived to our time, the famous Petrov drawing, depicts our city as it was in the 17th century. And we can see that there are other fortresses protecting Moscow apart from the Kremlin, namely the Kitai Gorod, Beli Gorod, and the famous Zemlyanoy Val, also called Skorodom. Please note that this is no map, but a plan. So the orientation here is different from the cardinal direction our modern maps use. The north is on the right, not on the top. When were the other Moscow fortifications built? The Kitai Gorod was erected under the rule of Ivan the Terrible's mother, Yelena Glinskaya, in the early 16th century. The name Kitai Gorod means a city, Gorod, upon Kitas, fortifications of wood and soil. It is in no way related to China and the Chinese. The word Kita sounds very similar to China or Kitai in Russian. The other two fortifications, which used to run where two more major roads, the boulevard ring and the garden ring are situated today, the Beli Gorod and the Zimlenoy Gorod, respectively, were built as early as in the late 16th century. The name Beli Gorod is related either to the color of its walls or to the fact that its inhabitants were free of certain taxes and called white segment of population, hence Beli Gorod, white town. The Zemlanoi or wooden gorod, also called Skorodom, took its name from its wooden walls built upon earth mounds that were constructed within two years or very swiftly, hence Skorodom, swift house. While Moscow's heart, the Kremlin, was the administrative center of the capital, the Kitai gorod was the trading center of the city, and the Beli Gorod and the Zemlyanoi Gorod housed artisanal communities and strelets, soldier troops. The fact is that the life of any medieval city is based on the trade and craft, but we will discuss it later. The walls of the Kitai Gorod were built in the early 16th century on the commission from the mother of Ivan the Terrible, Yelena Glinskaya. The walls of the Beli Gorod and the Zemlenoi Gorod were constructed in the late 16th century under the rule of Fyodor I, the last Tsar from the Rurik dynasty on the Moscow throne. Here we can see the Moskva River and Niglinia again, and of course, the names of these fortresses are often obscure to modern people. There is no connection between the Kitai Gorod and China, Kitai in Russian. The fortress took its name after the Kitas, structures made of wood and earth. They were erected to support the walls of the fortification. The Beli Gorod was called so because it was home to white, Beli, population free of some taxes. And the Zimlenoi or wooden Gorod, also called Skorodom, was given such a name because of the materials used to build it so swiftly within no more than two years. That is how the name Skorodom appeared. Skori means swift in Russian. Traditionally, Russian artisans and craftspeople used to take residence close to each other, 
Smiths used to live near other smiths. Weavers or hamovniks used to reside near their colleagues. Potters near other potters. Hence, the Potter Sloboda, or place where potters lived. The Potter Sloboda was located over the Yauza River. The fact is that all fire hazardous shops, such as potteries and smitheries, were traditionally located at the banks of the Moskva and other rivers in the city. This was both due to their need for water to function and fire safety concerns. Here we can see a model recreating a house of a Moscow potter. At the time, a house always had a yard. Such houses with yards constituted medieval cities as a whole. It looks pretty much like a village, doesn't it? We can see here the house where the potter and his family lived, as well as various side buildings, stock and poultry barns, and of course, the pottery shop. The shed furnace located in the yard, the small pits containing defective pottery pieces that got cracked or broken after the baking process and thus thrown away. Our large collection of pottery shows what kind of ware residents of Moscow used in the medieval times. This included, for example, traditional pots for cooking in the furnace, flasks that people could take when traveling, also jars and such funny items that we call rukamois or hand washes. There is a folk byword about these items, which reads, getting up early, I'll go to the sheep, his nose of clay, his head sounds gay. Why would people start their morning from visiting these sheep? To wash their faces naturally. Residents of Moscow used rukamois as part of their daily morning routine. Look at these vessels in front of you. They have different and unusual shapes, with bulky bodies and very tight necks. They are called kubushka pots. Remember the saying, keep your money in kubushkas? And indeed, the smallest kubushka pots could be used to hide a money stock or something else inside. Our Moscow trade market offered beautiful wear, various food products, clothes, shoes and different household items. So, the saying, you shall have at home the good from Moscow market, is not empty words. And this magnificent artwork by Apolinari Vasnitsov features the Moscow market and the Red Square in the late 17th century. Please note the rows of tents in the left part of the picture. There were over 120 of them. And indeed, the Moscow market offered the fullest variety of medieval goods a city could offer. The name of the Red Square is a late one. And this place was called originally the market or the fire. Why are you hurrying as if to a fire? Not to put out a burning neighboring house, but to the market place. The market was the heart of the city life. Here we can see the architectural complex of the Red Square that survived to our days. The Spaska Tower already has its beautiful, hipped top and has its present height. The St. Basil Cathedral, erected in the middle of the 16th century, shows off its dazzling, colorful walls and domes, while the Kremlin walls are white, not red. Their color is due to the fact that the walls used to be washed regularly. The red brick walls were covered with lime wash that protected them. This painting by Apolinari Vasnitsov can be called the Encyclopedia of Moscow Life. Here we can see more than trade rows. We can see the life of Moscow's precauses. Precauses are counterparts of modern ministries and offices. In the foreground, we can see the official, or diak. He is reading a decree of a governmental order, and there is a smart carriage moving out of the Kremlin gate. Its passenger can be a boyar or another person of high standing, returning to their Moscow residence after visiting the monarch or sitting at the boyar Duma meeting. In the center of the picture, there are two interesting companies. The artist tells us how the state guarded residents of the city in the medieval times. We can see arrested people and a Yarishka, or the lowest police official in the medieval city, his sword bad, escorting the arrested who are probably criminals. A little further back, there is a group of men in European dresses. If the four musketeers, Athos, Porthos, Aramis and D'Artagnan, found themselves in the medieval Moscow, they would be probably astonished by the surrounding wild grandeur, just as the characters of Apolinari Vasnitsov's painting are.
We can also see common citizens, small folk, soldiers and a woman with her child in the left lower corner. This colorful crowd of residents of Moscow was depicted by the artful hand of Apolinari Vasnetsov in this work created in 1925. The artist made a great contribution to the work of our museum, and we consider him a true glorifier of Moscow. Unfortunately, our short tour will not allow discussing the whole medieval history of Moscow with all aspects of its life and showing all the beautiful things the museum showcases. History of Moscow for children and adults.